I am the ghost of the Uchiha. Hey guys welcome back to the main channel. This will be the first Harry Potter crossover that will be in this channel. This is what if Naruto traveled to the world of Harry Potter. The trust of a child is a fragile thing. Naruto becomes disenchanted with Konoha and the Sandame Hokage when he stumbles upon the truth of who and what he is on his eighth birthday. Armed with the knowledge that there was a slight chance he still might have living relatives, Naruto runs away from Konoha and the lies that had cut him to the quick. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe and check the author in the description. Let's start. Chapter 1. Lies and Leave Taking October 10, 1998, Evening Konohagakure no Sato, Hai no Kuni. Eight-year-old Uzumaki Naruto cut to the left at the last second instead of to the right like he usually did as he reached the end of the street with a large mob of angry drunks somewhere behind him in hot pursuit. Ever since he'd been tossed out of the orphanage at just a few months shy of age six, when he started at the Konoha Shinobi Academy, he'd been chased all through the village if he dared to show his face after sunset. He'd had nearly a one and a half years respite from the angry mobs after the Sandame Hokage had set him up with an apartment, after the man had learned that he'd been living on the streets for several months, but that only lasted until someone discovered where he lived earlier that afternoon. On the day of his eighth birthday, no less, three hours after the sun had gone down, his apartment had been broken into and Naruto had barely escaped the mob by jumping out of his bedroom window. And so here he was being chased through the streets of Konoha again. At least the drunken civilians chasing him were fairly easy to ditch when compared to the shinobi that often chased after him through the day each time that he got caught pranking the village. Dressed as he was in bright kill me now orange, most people would think that the eight-year-old would have difficulty in evading anyone but Naruto had quickly become an expert at stealth and concealment. He had to be if he wanted to survive in a village that hated him. Hearing his pursuers falling even further behind, Naruto took the opportunity to hunt for a hiding place where he could spend the night undisturbed since he knew that going back to his apartment at this point would only be asking for them to find him again. He found the perfect place in the form of a warehouse that looked to be neglected and forgotten. After glancing behind him to make certain that no one was watching him, Naruto ducked into the deeper shadows and slipped around to the back of the building where he promptly picked the locks to the warehouse's back door so that he could slip inside. The child then promptly locked the door behind him, in case anyone thought to check the building, before he moved further into the warehouse that he soon learned was something of a storage facility for old documents. He thought it really odd that there hadn't been any real security measures to prevent someone from breaking in and stealing the documents. What he didn't realize was that the building itself was normally hidden under a specialized genjutsu and combination barrier that prevented anyone from ever discovering the warehouse existed if they were specifically looking for the building but didn't have authorization to enter it. A genjutsu and barrier that he'd barreled right through in his desperate hurry to escape his pursuers. Something that was only possible because he hadn't been looking for that specific building. Naruto stared around him in nervousness for a few minutes, out of fear that he'd tripped an alarm of sorts, before he gradually relaxed as five minutes and then ten minutes passed without anyone barging in to capture him. It was at that point that he began searching for some out-of-the-way spot to curl up for the night. After walking up and down the rows and rows of boxes for several minutes looking for and failing to find a place to sleep for the night, Naruto's curiosity got the better of him and he began digging through random boxes and peeked at the occasional file. He probably would have fallen asleep over one of the boxes of boring files if he hadn't stumbled upon the stack of boxes that held the records and important documents for those people whose surname started with, you. He chuckled when he discovered that Aruka sensei was only 10 years older than him. The Chunin instructor had always come off far older than 18 whenever he caught Naruto playing hooky from classes in order to prank the village. It was even more of a surprise to discover that the rather strict Chunin had been something of a class clown and prankster while he'd been in the academy. The man didn't seem to be the type. It wasn't until Naruto found his own birth certificate that Naruto found anything worthwhile though. The names of his parents. The moment the eight-year-old read their names, he knew that Serutobi Hirazan, the Sandame Hokage, had lied to him all his life. There was no way that the man hadn't known exactly who Naruto's parents were. After all, the Sandame had been very close to the Yandaimi Hokage, one Namakaze Minato, according to everything he'd learned through the few history classes he'd actually stayed awake for. So, the Sandame would have known that Minato's wife had become pregnant. The knowledge that a man he'd seen as something of a grandfather for as long as he could remember had lied to him hurt. Especially when he knew the man knew how much it would have meant to Naruto to know that he had had a family at one point. 
The man had left Naruto to think that his parents had abandoned him like a piece of garbage in the night. Not even bothering to tell Naruto that he knew them and that they died. Naruto could have taken not learning his parents' names until he was older, he wasn't stupid. He could have understood the need to keep the identity of his parents a secret in order to protect himself from his father's enemies, in exchange for the Hokage telling him that his parents hadn't abandoned him and that he wasn't just some nameless orphan. It was the last straw for the blonde-haired, blue-eyed, bewhiskered boy. He could take the spiteful and hateful looks from the villagers. He could ignore the angry accusations and cruel name-calling from adults and children alike. He could even handle the numerous drunken mobs that sought to beat him black and blue the moment the sun set, they never actually caught him, after all. He could take being shunned by all but a very small handful of individuals all of his life. And he could accept the unending loneliness that had dogged his heels since the moment he understood what loneliness was. But he could not take the knowledge that the man he'd loved and respected had looked him right in the eye and lied to him. Because, if the Sandame could lie about knowing who his parents were and what had happened to them, then what else had the man lied to him about? Did he know why the villagers hated him? He knew it wasn't because of the pranks like the Sandame always claimed it was since he'd only started pranking them because of the cold looks and cruel names. Did he know why the villagers always called him a demon each time they spoke about him when they didn't think he could hear them? Would the villagers ever accept him just because he earned his Hitai 8 like Serutobi had hinted they would? Or was the old man just looking to use Naruto for his own ends? Tears coursed down Naruto's face as something inside of him twisted and died. When his tears finally stopped several hours later, Naruto wiped his face off on his sleeve before he thumbed through the other certificates in the folder alongside of his birth certificate. He was a little puzzled when he found his father's birth certificate in the packet. His father's last name started with, and not, you, and therefore should have been in the box with the other, in files. He then supposed that if someone was looking for information on Namikaze Minato, then it would be much harder to find that information if it was misfiled. After all, who would think to look for the man's files in the box holding all of the use? Naruto only spent a few minutes studying his mother's shinobi application and photograph. A pretty red-haired woman named Uzumaki Kashina who he'd never heard of before seeing his birth certificate. The only interesting thing he'd learned about his mother was that she was a distant cousin to the Shodai Hokage's wife. Uzumaki Mito. Of much more interest, were the certificates of his father's parents, uncle, and grandparents. Knowing that he'd come from a very small clan of talented shinobi, completely unaware of his mother's more impressive clan, was like a bomb to the eight-year-old soul and it helped to wash away the pain of his broken heart. It wasn't until he began tucking everything back into the folder that Naruto realized one very important fact. There was no death certificate on file for his uncle, his grandfather's younger brother, Namikaze Kichiro. The eight-year-old dug back into the thick file and began separating everything out into individual piles. One pile for each person. Once everything had been sorted, he stuffed all of the papers back into the file folder bar those that pertained to his uncle. The man had been born on March 3, 1937. Earned his Hitai 8 at age 7, earned his flak jacket at age 9, and been retired from the ranks of shinobi at age 13 due to his chakra coils being damaged beyond repair while on a mission. The last bit of information in the man's documents was that he'd chosen to leave the elemental countries to seek healing roughly six months after his coils had been damaged. Naruto was a bit confused. The official notice of leave said that the man was leaving the elemental countries and not just leaving Konohagakure no Sato. Did that mean that there were other countries beyond what they were taught in the academy during geography lessons? Even if that was the case, why would his grand uncle think he could be healed by someone outside of the elemental counties? Why weren't they taught about the lands beyond the elemental countries in the academy? Shouldn't they know what was out there in case there was a threat to the village? But the most important questions in Naruto's mind were, why didn't his grand uncle ever return from wherever it was that he had gone? Was his grand uncle still alive and living outside of the elemental countries? Or had his uncle been killed the moment he left the elemental countries? Could his uncle have children or grandchildren still living in the outer countries? They were all questions that Naruto desperately wanted and needed to know the answers to. Answers that he'd have to leave Konoha in order to find. Leaving the only home he'd known never would have crossed the eight-year-old's mind before. He'd loved this village with all of his heart because he'd loved Serutobi Hiruzen and the old man loved the village. His honorary grandfather had broken his heart though and while Naruto was also fond of Kanzaki Tuchi and Ayame, the nice old man that ran the ramen stand and his daughter, and Amino Aruka, the only sensei from the academy that didn't treat him like trash, they just hadn't inspired the same level of loyalty that the Hokage had prior to this night's revelations. Naruto would spend the rest of the night pacing back and forth as he tried to decide what to do. 
He wouldn't make a decision until after he'd puzzled through the rest of the files from his family's folder and learned that all of his teachers at the academy had been lying to him and the rest of the students for years. The Yandaimi had not killed the Kayubi no Yuko on the night the Kayubi had attacked Konoha. It turns out that demons can't be killed because they were far too powerful and they weren't actually normal creatures. They were immortal monsters. No, the demon still lived and according to the classified document that had been tucked into his family's folder, the demon had been sealed inside of Naruto just hours after he'd been born. There was no way that the entire village hadn't known that information based upon all of the verbal, mental, emotional, and in a handful of rare cases physical abuse that he'd suffered for as long as he could remember. The moment that Naruto learned he carried the Kayubi inside of him, he decided that he'd leave the elemental countries to hunt down his uncle. Even if the man had died years ago, it would be far better to escape the village that hated his entire existence and the adults that had lied to him than it would be to stay and take more of their abuse. If he stayed, then he'd probably end up letting the Kayubi out at some point to get revenge for their cruelty and he refused to give them the satisfaction of being right when they labeled him as a demon. Escaping the village would not be an easy feat. He had no doubt that the village's Anbu guards would be sent out to bring him back the moment he was discovered missing. He knew that from experience due to the few times he'd fled into forest outside of the village to escape angry mobs over the years. He'd also have to worry about surviving what promised to be a long journey on his own as he'd need food and supplies as well as a way to avoid bandits and well-meaning folks that would try to bring him back for his own good. The two years of lessons at the academy gave him a place to start. Ninjutsu, Taijutsu, Shuri Kenjutsu, and survival training. The problem was that until Aruka sensei started teaching him a year ago, all of his instructors had consistently sabotaged his education. The chunin that monitored the academy library had denied Naruto access to the books and scrolls that would have helped Naruto to learn the required material. Naruto wouldn't even know how to read or write, though he wasn't all that great at the latter. If not for Ayame taking the time to help him when he'd stop by the ramen stand for supper whenever he had the money to purchase a couple of bowls of ramen. When Naruto left the storage building just before sunrise, he carried with him the file of documents pertaining to his family, the entire thing tucked beneath his shirt and jacket so it wouldn't be noticed, to keep anyone from figuring out where he'd gone by searching through said documents. He returned to his apartment to find the entire place a mess. All of his things busted and the walls painted over with graffiti and threats. It was just one more reason for him to leave. Naruto would spend most of the morning cleaning up the messes, hauling his broken furniture, ruined clothes, and spoiled food out to the garbage. He then spent another hour repairing the broken lock on his door as best he could before he picked up those items that had been salvageable so that he could walk through the apartment without tripping over everything. The file he'd stolen was carefully stashed beneath the loose floorboards at the back of his closet where it wouldn't be found. He then took a shower and a nap. When he woke up, he found that the busted furniture, ripped clothes, rotten food, and broken lock had been replaced while he slept. Instead of giving him a feeling of warmth like it would have previously, the new items were proof that he was being watched but that his watchers couldn't be bothered to protect him from the angry villagers. The eight-year-old had been tempted to throw the new stuff out but realized if he did that, then it would only draw unwanted attention. He actually needed those items anyway, at least until he was ready to leave. It would take two months and eight days for Naruto to prepare for his journey to the outer countries. He started by breaking into the academy library after hours and painstakingly copying down any information he could find regarding the outer countries as well as detailed directions for any jutsu or survival skill that would be useful, using an abundance of tracing paper as it was easier for him to read tracings than his own writing. This included the Henge no Jutsu, the Bunshin no Jutsu, the Kawarimi no Jutsu, and the Nawanuk no Jutsu in addition to chakra control exercises such as the Ha no Nudo, Kinobori no Vaza, and Suimin Hoku no Vaza. He also traced the guidelines for making snares and other useful traps, for catching live game, what to look for when setting up camp, how to identify edible plants, and how to clean and cook the food you hunted and gathered in the wild. On his third night in the library, Naruto looked up more information about his parents. While working through what the books and scrolls said about his father, he learned that the Yandaimi Hokage had given Konoha a number of high-level techniques and seals that were kept locked up in the Hokage's vault in order to prevent them from being misused. It didn't take Naruto long to decide that as his father's son, he deserved to have a copy of each and every technique that his father had created. Those techniques could be considered his inheritance after all. Breaking into the Hokage's vault two nights after learning about the techniques that his father had left the village was nearly as easy as breaking into the academy library. If slightly more nerve-wracking for the eight-year-old. As luck would have it, during his first raid on the vault, Naruto would learn a powerful jutsu that would greatly speed up his plans to leave the village. The Cage Bunshin no Jutsu. 
It was a technique that would allow him to make solid clones that were powerful enough and smart enough to help him copy the information he needed and wanted, run errands for him, and when the time came for him to leave, play decoy for him. The best thing though, was that the cage Bunchen could pass memories of everything it learned back to the original according to what he understood of the notes beneath the instructions and hand seals to perform the jutsu. It only took Naruto eight hours to successfully learn the cage Bunchen and the moment he did, he set his army of clones, after discovering that he could create hundreds of them without tiring himself out, loose on the village. He sent twenty clones back to the academy library to copy anything interesting, another twenty were sent to the public library to look for anything useful, twenty more to scavenge used scrolls from the academy and mission desk that he could use to protect his tracings, only five were sent to sneak back into the Hokage's vault, and the remaining clones would scour the village training grounds for discarded weapons or other salvage that he could either use himself or sell. His many plans were something that was only possible due to his almost instinctive stealth and evasion skills on top of the village's universal belief that he was the dead last and therefore not smart enough or talented enough to learn a useful and exploitable jutsu like the cage bunchen. It also helped that the spikes of chakra sensed in and around his apartment were attributed to him practicing the small handful of skills he was learning in the academy and emotional outbursts, both of which had been true in the past. While his clones were doing that, Naruto was learning to make basic storage seals. A fuinjutsu that they had learned about in class not that long ago. Fuinjutsu was not taught to academy students though, that branch of techniques was exceedingly difficult to learn according to everything he'd been told. Most shinobi simply purchased pre-made storage seals from the shinobi stores scattered through the village but Naruto neither had the money nor the hitai 8 that would allow him to purchase the scrolls upon which the seals were created. So, if he wanted to take anything with him, he'd have to learn how to make his own storage scrolls in order to carry his things since not everything would fit in his backpack. The seals themselves were fairly simple and the theory behind them was easy enough for Naruto to understand but the problem was that he wasn't very good at drawing out the actual seals. An entire night of practicing drawing the seal helped solve that problem and once he could accurately replicate the seal, it only took him an hour to figure out just how much chakra to pour into the seal in order to activate the seal. Making it so that only he would be able to take anything out of the seal was as easy as mixing a few drops of his blood into the ink he used to create the seals. Once he got the storage seals down, Naruto would spend his nights learning the jutsu that he determined would be the most useful, since his clones were now copying practically everything instead of just the useful stuff. The first one he learned, not counting the cage bunchen, was the henge no jutsu because he could use it to buy food and camping supplies without getting thrown out of the stores, charge double or triple the cost of the items he needed, and so that no one would grow suspicious over the items he was buying. He also wore the henge when he took in the recyclables his clones collected each night and when he sold the damaged kanai, senbon, and shuriken to one of the local weaponsmiths so that they could be melted down and remade into new weapons. Half of the money he earned from the items he salvaged was tucked into a storage scroll in case he had to buy more food or pay for a room while he was traveling and the rest was used to buy his supplies. That clandestine income was supplemented by his weekly orphan stipend that Serutobi hand delivered every Friday when the man checked up on him. During those meetings, Naruto begged the man for stories about the Yandaimi, who had always been something of a hero to the blonde, in order to hide the anger he felt at the man for all the lies he'd been told. Hearing what his father had been like was just icing on the cake. During the days, when he was kicked out of class or if he managed to ditch Aruka, Naruto would disappear into the training grounds to practice his chakra control exercises and the Kawarimi no Jutsu. He also practiced his Taijutsu Katas, his Shuri Kenjutsu, and trap setting skills. Occasionally, he'd pull a prank in order to keep up appearances and to hone his stealth and evasion skills. After the first month of preparations had passed, Naruto discovered that his parents had purchased a house and that it had stood abandoned all this time. Sneaking into said house required quite a bit of ingenuity as it had better security than the Hokage's residence but that didn't stop Naruto. The house was filled with what the young boy considered a gold mine of weapons, scrolls, photos, and keepsakes all of which he'd seal up into storage seals in order to prevent the village that hated him from stealing them from him after he left. Despite the small fortune that the house had held in weapons and shinobi knowledge, it was the photographs, letters, and trinkets that meant the most to the diminutive blonde. Those precious items spoke of the love his parents had shared and that they had felt for him, he'd found and packed the nursery they'd set up for him. Clearing out the house had taken nearly an entire week as Naruto had very carefully packed everything into the storage scrolls based upon which room it had been found in who it had belonged to, if he could figure it out, and whether it was a keepsake, furniture, useful civilian item, a shinobi tool, or held information. By the time he finished, there was nothing left in the entire house. Even the cupboards had been emptied out, all of the expired food thrown out. 
If he'd known how and it wouldn't draw the entire village's attention, Naruto would have sealed the entire house into a storage scroll so that he could take it with him too. The final five weeks he remained in the village were spent mastering his new skills and experimenting with the cage bunchen. Trying to learn the full extent to which the clones pass their memories and experiences back to him. He had been very happy to learn that the clones could help him improve his chakra control by passing that experience back to him but he'd been annoyed to learn that they could also pass their exhaustion back to him. Letting a few of them lounge around and sleep all day also didn't give him an energy boost when he was feeling tired and worn out at the end of the day. He could sleep while his clones worked but if even one of them dispelled while he was sleeping, he'd wake up. On Friday, December 18, 1990, Naruto purposefully pulled his most memorable prank yet. He painted graffiti on the faces of the Hokage's monument in broad daylight after he'd hid his backpack, filled to the bursting with his storage scrolls of supplies, information, and belongings, in an unused training ground near the edge of the village. After being chased for an hour by a horde of on-duty shinobi, Aruka caught him as planned and he was given a lecture in front of his entire class. He was then made to sit in the corner between lessons until the academy let out at 3.15. As soon as lessons were over for the day, Aruka supervised Naruto as he washed the paint from the four faces carved into the cliff that towered above the entire village. As much as he would have preferred leaving his final prank for someone else to clean up, Aruka making him do the work himself actually played into his plans because it would give him a valid reason for being out after dark. That Aruka sensei actually bribed him with ramen to get him to work faster was unexpected and a rather nice farewell meal since it would allow him to have one last bowl of heaven before he left the village. Ichiraku's ramen being the only thing he'd really regret leaving behind. Three bowls of ramen later, Naruto bid his sensei good night and headed towards his apartment until he reached the red light distract where he purposefully allowed one of the drunks he knew hated him to see him walking about alone. It took all of five minutes for the drunk to take the bait and call the rest of his buddies out for a little, demon, hunting. Naruto smirked, as he led the group on a wild goose chase through the village. The eight-year-old purposefully staying just a few feet ahead of the mob instead of attempting to outrun them and hide like he normally would. He eventually headed for the training ground where his things had been stashed earlier, putting just a bit more distance between himself and his pursuers. It wouldn't do to allow anyone to see him collecting his things after all and he couldn't afford to let the mob actually catch him. Two hours and fifteen minutes after he'd said goodnight to Aruka and the Kanzakis, Naruto slipped out of the village with his backpack in hand and went to ground after making a single cage bunchen that hid in plain sight. The original Naruto then waited until he saw the masked Anbu guards show up to escort his cage bunchen back to his apartment before he slipped out from his hiding spot and headed west beneath the light of the stars in the darkness of the new moon. Once the walls of Konoha were no longer visible over the tops of the trees, Naruto stopped and changed into the dark green and black clothes he'd purchased for himself in order to make it harder for someone to see him traveling through the shadows. He also pulled on a hood and cloth face mask to hide his pale skin and bright hair. Two things that would stand out almost as much as his orange tracksuits did. The eight-year-old would run himself ragged for the next three nights as he sought to put as much distance between himself and Konoha as possible. Traveling from sunset to sunrise in order to hide from any other travelers and sleeping inside of dead tree trunks or caves during the day. His clone would dispel at sunrise on the 21st as planned and Naruto let out a sigh of relief when he received his memories from that clone. No one had discovered his decoy and his leaving had not been noticed. The fact that his clone had dispelled itself in his apartment undiscovered would hopefully throw any pursuit off for another couple of days before anyone stumbled across his three-day-old trail. A severe winter rainstorm passing through the area around that time would actually wipe out all traces of his passing. On his sixth night of travel, Naruto crossed the border between Hai no Kuni and Tani no Kuni and swung south in order to avoid running into any shinobi patrols from a Megakure no Sato that might seek to harm him. He also avoided the scattered villages he came across unless he needed to purchase extra supplies. Then he'd enter them under a henge, buy what he needed, and leave as quickly as possible. He passed out of Tani no Kuni and into Kei's no Kuni on his tenth night of travel and slowed down as he left the forests behind. Crossing Kei's no Kuni would be the hardest leg of his journey because it was all desert and while Naruto had read about how to survive in the desert, he had no first-hand experience and really had no idea where to find water if he should run out before he reached the western border. There were also far fewer villages scattered about the country where he could purchase more supplies. Meaning that he was forced to survive off of the land even more so than he had during the first few weeks of his journey. Naruto quickly learned to use a variation of Suimin Hoku no Vaza to run on the shifting surface of the sand. Another lesson he learned fairly quickly was to find a sheltered place to camp at the first signs of a sandstorm. And perhaps the most important lesson he learned was how to collect moisture in a cup by digging a deep hole in the sand 
setting a cup in the bottom, covering the hole with plastic, and setting a rock in the center of the plastic so that the water dripped down into the cup below. He also learned to catch as much rain as he could during the short and infrequent thunderstorms that passed over the sandy terrain and that roasted scorpions were actually tastier than they looked or sounded. And while he lost weight as he crossed the desert, he wasn't starving and he wasn't too badly burnt since he continued to travel by night and sleep by day, which also reduced his chances of freezing to death since it was still winter and the desert was freezing at night. The eight-year-old would reach the border between Kei's no Kuni and Yama no Kuni on his 25th day of travel. It had taken him 15 days to cross the small fraction of desert he'd traveled over. It was at that point that his resolve almost broke as the towering mountains that the country was named after looked harsh and foreboding. It didn't help that Naruto had no knowledge of where he was supposed to go from that point. The only information he'd found on how to get to the outer country spoke of a portal he'd need to find but gave no location or even a description of where the portal would be or what it looked like. The thought of turning tail and running back to Konoha and the abuse of the villagers coupled with the knowledge that he'd be punished for running away in the first place was more than enough to spur him on once he got over his fear. Chapter 2. On the other side Friday January 22, 1999, morning. Konohagakure no Sato, Hai no Kuni the Sandame Hokage watched from his office window as his shinobi scoured the village in search of the missing blonde child that housed the Kayubi. From the moment Uruka had reported that Naruto had not turned up when classes restarted after the winter break and that he'd been unable to locate the child in any of his usual hiding holes, Serutobi Hirazan had felt an icy stone settle in his stomach. He'd immediately sent his Anbu out into the village to search for clues as to what had happened to the young child. They'd all come back empty-handed. No one had even seen a glimpse of the boy since the 20th of December. The fact that there had not been one single prank played in all that time confirmed the boy was not simply hiding to evade capture. That knowledge bothered him because no one had felt the need to look into the matter sooner or even inform him of the anomaly and he never had time to visit the boy this time of the year due to the sheer amount of paperwork he had to deal with before the end of the year. Throughout the last eight years, he'd struggled to protect the child as much as he could when he was blocked at almost every turn by the councils and his advisors. He'd been far too tired and heartsick to fight them at every turn due to his grief over losing his wife, the love of his life, Minato, who'd been like a son to him, Kashina, a source of much laughter in Serutobi's life, and hundreds of shinobi and civilians alike all in one night. And then he'd lost Choko, his beloved daughter, just four years after that when she died giving birth to his first and only grandson. To lose Uzumaki Naruto now, who'd been both an honorary grandson to him and Minato and Kashina's living legacy, in more than one way, was a harsh blow. The knowledge that he'd allowed his grief to lead him down this road tasted bitter in the back of his throat as he only had himself to blame. Anger soon followed the guilt and he swore he'd take the village apart brick by brick to find the little blonde bundle of sunshine if he had to. When he got his hands on the person or persons responsible for kidnapping the child, he'd make an example of them before the entire village. And they had better pray that Naruto was unharmed or he'd show them exactly why it was unwise to piss off the shinobi no kami. Turning away from the window, Serutobi faced the five men standing in the room with him, their faces hidden beneath porcelain masks cast in the shape of various animals and addressed them, it is time to deal with Danzo. I want every last weed that that man has allowed to take root in my village to be ripped out in its entirety. If he resists, kill him, it is high time that I cleared the village of rotting deadwood. Hi, Hokage-sama. Serutobi didn't bother to watch the men leave, instead turning back to face the window as he continued to monitor the blue and green clad shinobi patrolling the streets and interrogating the villagers as he tried not to think about the fact that he'd just ordered his former friend and rival to be killed if he resisted arrest. Every so often, a man or a woman would be dragged off in the direction of the torture and interrogation facility to be questioned further. The Sandame could practically see the fear spreading through the village as the civilians were abruptly reminded that this village was a military village, not a peaceful civilian village. He would teach them the folly of mistaking his benevolence for weakness. Friday, January 22, 1999, Morning Yama no Kuni, Elemental Nations and Mount. Asahi, Hokkaido, Japan It would take Naruto ten long days to find the portal. Two days of that time spent running from a small group of bandits that had crossed paths with him at one point. Naruto hadn't recognized the portal for what it was at first. The weatherworn seals barely visible on the face of the mountain between two of the taller ridges and only visible at very specific times of the day. He'd actually passed the thing twice before he'd caught the briefest glimpse of the seals as the sun hit them just right to form shadows of the slight depressions and found the ancient stone sign post designating the spot as the west gate. The eight-year-old had then camped beside the portal for two days before he worked up the courage to activate the portal using his chakra. 
Sapphire eyes danced with wonder as his chakra raced through the seals carved onto the side of the mountain. The lines of the seals glowing blue as he continued to pour chakra into the stone until the entire design was glowing brightly. The moment he dropped his hands, the wall shimmered with the light of the seals for several seconds before the light seemed to melt into the very stone to form a doorway of what looked like water. Swallowing his doubts and fears, Naruto hitched his backpack up higher on his back before he stuck a hand into the liquid light and felt warmth engulf his fingers instead of the chill he'd expected. Feeling reassured, Naruto stepped forward to pass through the strange warmth of the portal and immediately found himself stepping out onto the mountain again. For several minutes, Naruto thought he'd done something wrong until he realized that the mountain he was standing on looked nothing like the mountain he'd just left behind. A glance behind him revealed a much less worn version of the portal he'd activated on the other side. The seals far easier to read even if they were still somewhat weather-worn. Turning away from the inactive portal, Naruto turned his eyes outwards. The view from his current position was absolutely magnificent, even better than the view from the top of the Hokage's monument, and his eyes darted back and forth as he tried to take in everything. After several long minutes of just staring out over the countryside that the mountain overlooked, it dawned on Naruto that he'd made it. He'd escaped the elemental countries without getting caught and dragged back to Konoha. Elation filled the eight-year-old and he whooped loudly before he tried to figure out which way he should go. Did he continue traveling west in the hopes of finding a village where he could get directions or did he pick another direction? Uncertain of where to go next, Naruto created 50 cage bunchen and sent them off in groups of five to find a way down out of the mountains and search for any sign of civilization. While he waited for his clones to return or dispel, Naruto unsealed the information he'd gathered on the outer countries and read through it again while he ate a handful of dried apricots for breakfast, the eight-year-old had been too nervous to eat before he had activated the portal. An hour later, the first group dispelled and Naruto winced when he discovered that the mountain he was sitting on was actually an active volcano based upon what his clones had found above the portal before they dispelled. He immediately began to worry how safe he was sitting on the mountain as he was and he nearly bolted straight down the side of the mountain in a sheer panic. The information he got from the second and third group, which had both dispelled at the same time, proved much more helpful and filled Naruto with more than a little relief. The second group had seen what appeared to be a large village off in the distance to the northwest of the volcano while the third group had discovered what appeared to be a hiking trail on the north side of the volcano, five miles below the portal. Without bothering to wait and see what his other clones discovered, Naruto packed up the few things he'd taken out and made a beeline for the trail. Once he reached the trail, the eight-year-old kept to the trees beside the trail in order to avoid being seen by any hikers moving about in the area. Traveling through the daylight hours felt more than a little strange for the eight-year-old after he'd been moving through the darkness for so long. He would have preferred to continue traveling by night but knew it would be far safer to travel through the daylight hours now that he was in completely unknown territory with no maps, no written directions, and no clue as to what dangers lurked on this side of the portal. It would also be far easier to gather information during the day as that was when most other people would be moving about. It would take Naruto three days to make his way down to the outskirts of the village his clones had seen from the summit of the mountain. The moment he got his first up-close view of the village, icy fear griped Naruto's heart as he stared in shock at the sheer size of the town. He'd once thought Konoha had been large but when compared to the sprawling metropolis in front of him, Konoha might as well have been a poor farm village. On top of that, the noisy metal carriages that ran without horses were strange beyond belief and the smell they gave off burned the inside of Naruto's sensitive nose and made his eyes water while the sounds they made hurt his ears. Naruto had no idea where to even start looking for his uncle in such a place. Luckily for the eight-year-old, he at least had a way to make the search a tiny bit less daunting. Under cover of night, Naruto used the Taju Cage Bunch and No Jutsu to create roughly 500 clones that slipped into the city one by one. Each one of them under a different henge to look like an assortment of birds, cats, dogs, rats, and more than a few foxes. Their orders, for their first foray into the city, were merely to explore the streets and get a feel for what the place was like and where things were located. They also had very specific orders not to dispel all at the same time. Naruto didn't want to turn his brain into mush after all and he'd learned early on that dispelling too many clones at once gave him a severe migraine on top of exhausting him with their fatigue. While his clones were off learning about the city, Naruto hunted for a place to camp for a few days. Making certain that it was far enough out from the city that he wouldn't be noticed but close enough that he could enter the city reasonably quickly if he needed to for any reason. Once he found a suitable location, he set up his camp and thoroughly trapped the area to prevent anyone from sneaking up on him. He then made himself something to eat before he curled up in his sleeping bag and tried not to think about just how daunting of a task he'd set himself. His dreams that night were frightening, 
his imagination spinning out of his control as it took the worst of his memories and combined them with the memories his clones sent him of the city he'd stumbled upon. The nightmares started with crushing mobs, far larger than those he'd faced in Konoha, chasing him and cornering him every time he turned around only for him to end up being chased by the frightening machines that sped along the roads until he stumbled across a man that looked like an older Minato who glared at him with cold and hateful eyes. Naruto jerked awake after that last one with a strangled cry and tears pouring down his face. Once he realized it had only been a night terror, the eight-year-old relaxed a bit and wiped his face clean. Knowing he wouldn't be able to sleep again any time soon, for fear of facing yet another nightmare, Naruto got up and threw himself into his taijutsu training. Each set of katas he did only reinforced his determination to find his uncle and prove that his nightmares and the village that had hated him were both wrong. He was not an unlovable demon. His fear that his uncle would hate him just as much as the villagers he left behind was soon buried once more beneath his sweat and a burning desire for a family. Over the next three days, Naruto continued to train himself into the ground as he waited for his clones to find something that he could use to decide his next move. He'd lost a few the first night when those strange metal contraptions ran them over, the memories of which had helped to fuel his nightmares, in addition to losing a few as they were captured in traps, mostly the rats, or kicked about by people during the day, a small number of people seeing the stray cats and dogs as filthy vermin. The memories they'd collected before their deaths were proving exceedingly helpful though as they allowed him to familiarize himself with the city's layout without risk of him getting injured or mugged. It was on his second day of waiting, when his clones reported to him a discovery of utmost importance. The city, which he'd learned the first night was called Asahakawa Shi, was famous for its ramen and there must be dozens of ramen restaurants and stands spread throughout the city. Naruto automatically assumed that he'd just landed in the ramen capital of the world as he began drooling over the prospect of sampling the many different types of ramen his clones had seen throughout their explorations. It would be a few months before he learned that there were many cities throughout Japan that were famous for their ramen and that it was Fukuoka-shi in Kyushu that was considered by a good number of people to be the ramen capital of Japan. The only thing that prevented Naruto from rushing into town to devour his first bowl of ramen in ages, it had been well over a month since his last bowl of Ichiraku's ramen after all, was the fact that the prices were confusing him. All of the stands his clones had seen were asking between 600 and 1000 yen for a single bowl of ramen and he wasn't certain how much that would be in Ryo. He didn't even know if the restaurants and stand owners would take Ryo in place of yen and he couldn't afford to spend all of his money on ramen when he still had no idea where to find his uncle. On the afternoon of his third day waiting, Naruto froze as he received a memory from one of his clones. The clone in question had been wandering around in the henge of a fox, his way of thumbing his nose at Konoha for their treatment of him due to his status as the Kayubi's host, when it had been picked up by the scruff of the neck quite unexpectedly and found itself face to face with a rather formidable looking man. I felt you running all over the city for the last three days and at first thought the elemental countries had somehow managed to send an army through the portals until I realized that each and every one of the 500 or so points of chakra running wild through the city all carried the same signature. That made me stop and think about how one person could possibly manage to be in so many different places at one time until I recalled GG speaking of a man that could make clones. I'm quite impressed that you could manage to create so many copies of yourself without killing yourself as I distinctly recall my grandfather saying that solid clones were a costly technique to use. I was further impressed when I observed several dozen of your clones and noted that they all looked quite different and that you'd hidden them as animals instead of people. However, I can't just let you keep running all over the city like that though. Someone is bound to notice the sudden increase in strays and start investigating. So, if you are not the original, then I need you to take a message back to the original and tell him to get rid of the rest of his clones and meet me right here in three hours. It is probably best that the original comes disguised as another fox because I don't know if the clothes you are wearing will stand out or not and those of us that live in the elemental district don't need the added attention that that will draw to us as it will only make our job all that much harder. I will give you my word that I mean you no harm. It is my job to keep those who pass through the portal from drawing attention to themselves. I can also provide you with maps and information to help you find whatever it was that brought you to the outer countries, no matter what your reason. The man had then set the fox back down on the ground and the clone in question had watched the man for a few minutes before he promptly dispelled himself to pass along the messages requested. A crow clone had dispelled itself a few minutes later. The clone had followed the man through the air as he wound his way through the streets and entered a walled-off section that had a huge sign proclaiming it to be the elemental district. The crow clone had also noted a couple of other clones arriving in the area before it dispelled so Naruto knew the man was under surveillance. Naruto debated with himself for close to an hour on whether or not he'd do as the man asked. In the end, he figured it couldn't hurt to meet with the man at least once just to find out what the man had to say. 
He couldn't really walk away from a chance to get a few of his questions answered about the dangerous machines that ran through the city and whether or not he could buy ramen with the ryo he'd saved up and brought with him. To that end, Naruto created four new clones and sent one of them to track down one of the older clones in order to pass along his orders to immediately pull out of the city and dispel in groups of five every ten minutes starting an hour after sunset, in order to give him time to meet with the man without being distracted by a flood of memories and to prevent a large backlash of memories. Once the clone headed for the city, Naruto set about packing up his camp and dismantling his traps. The eight-year-old and the three remaining clones then made their way closer to the village before he transformed into a fox as the man had requested, his clones transforming alongside of him into a trio of birds to follow him from above, and slipped into the city. Naruto paused when he received a set of memories from one of his original clones indicating that his message had been passed on in addition to all of the information it had gathered over the past three days. As soon as he sorted through those memories, Naruto began moving again. Taking care to avoid both people and the smelly, roaring machines. He arrived at the appointed meeting place a good 35 minutes early and scouted about for the perfect hiding place as two of the newest clones set themselves up in clear view to act as sentries, one staying in the guise of a sparrow and the other changing into an orange tabby cat. The last clone with him had gone to shadow the man from earlier wearing the form of a pigeon to make certain he didn't try to pull any funny business. As soon as Naruto found and settled into a small gap beneath a set of stairs leading up into the building above him, he cast the Maize Gakure no Jutsu to further hide his presence as he settled down to wait for the man to return. He didn't have long to wait, the man arrived a good 15 minutes early. Naruto didn't rush out to greet him though, the blonde was far more interested in studying the man with his own eyes first. One of the first things he noted was that while the man easily noted the three clones in plain sight, Sparrow, Pigeon, and Cat, he didn't seem to know that the original Naruto was hiding under the stairs as he never once looked in that direction. The second thing he noted was the fact that the man didn't seem at all angry that Naruto didn't show himself immediately or that he hadn't exactly followed his instructions of dispelling all of the clones. In fact, the man's dark eyes held none of the cold hate that the villagers back in Konoha had. But Naruto wasn't dense enough to think that that meant that the man wouldn't hate him the moment he set eyes on him in his original form. After another ten minutes had passed, Naruto dropped the camouflage technique and slipped out of his hiding place. A small part of him pleased to note that the man jumped in surprise at his sudden appearance. Naruto warily watched as the man approached him, his posture defensive, much like a real fox would be if approached by a human. Easy, the man gruffly, if kindly, urged as he crouched down not far from where Naruto was poised to bolt at the first sign of trouble. I'm not going to hurt you but you can't keep wandering around on the streets. You could get into all kinds of trouble that would make life difficult for you. Naruto snorted. He was well aware of just how dangerous this new city had turned out to be after experiencing his clones being killed in a number of different ways. After a moment, he crept a little closer to the man and lifted his nose as he caught the man's scent. His mouth watering when he recognized the scent of ramen clinging to him. He sneezed and backed up a bit when the man laughed the moment that Naruto's stomach gave a loud growl in response to the smell of his favorite food. It sounds like you're a little hungry, the man needlessly stated a moment later. If you'll let me carry you back to the elemental district, my wife was just finishing supper and you're welcome to join us for the meal before you and I sit down and talk business. Izumi makes a mean salt ramen and we have baked yellow fish and shrimp tempura to go with it in addition to green tea ice cream for dessert. Your three friends are welcome to tag along if it will make you feel more comfortable. The prospect of a free home cooked meal was enough to sway Naruto. He was tired of his own cooking and from the scent clinging to the man, he hadn't been exaggerating about his wife's culinary skills. Two minutes later, Naruto was tensely cradled in the man's arms as he navigated the streets with ease while his three clones trailed them from the sky, all three of them now in sparrow form in order to draw less attention to their presence. The moment the five of them passed beneath the gate leading into the elemental district, Naruto felt an immediate difference as the level of pollution and noise dropped off dramatically and he stiffened in the man's arms as he scented the air. The elemental district is surrounded by an ancient barrier that separates us from the rest of the city, the man explained as he set Naruto down on the ground. It is safe for you to drop your disguise now. Naruto backed up several feet and eyed the man skeptically for a full minute before he studied the area he found himself inside. Instinctively taking note of the various places that he potentially could hide in and at least three alternate escape routes in the event that the man showed any signs of becoming hostile the moment he got a look at him. After a moment, Naruto glanced back towards the man who was patiently waiting and reluctantly dropped the henge he'd been wearing. Chikusho, you're nothing but a kid. The man swore in utter shock the moment he saw Naruto's true form. What are you doing running about the city alone? Where are your parents? Did something happen to them after you passed through the portal? 
Or is that another disguise? I'm not wearing a henge and my parents are dead. They died a long time ago, Naruto quietly replied as he backed up a bit further from the man. Who came with you then, kid? No one. Chikusho, the man cursed again as he pursed his lips and stared at Naruto with open concern. How old are you and how long have you been on your own? I'm eight and I've always been on my own. Are you going to chase me out now? No, I'm not going to chase you out. I'm just shocked that you are so young and unaccompanied by an adult. As I told your clone earlier, it is my job to make certain that those that pass through the portal on Asahi date can blend in on this side of the portal and to point them in the right direction to find whatever it was that they came here to find. My name is Sasaki Naoki. I am the guardian of the West Gate and the 15th mayor of Asahikawa Shi's elemental district. I'm Uzumaki Naruto, Datbeo, Naruto declared as he completely relaxed the moment he sensed the man's sincerity, a large grin springing into place beneath the cloth face mask he still wore. It is a pleasure to meet you, Uzumaki-kun. If you'll follow me, I will guide you to the bathing house so that you can clean up before I take you home and introduce you to my wife. Do you have a clean set of clothes to change into or do we need to stop and get you something to borrow until those are washed? I have clean clothes. The hot shower Naruto took felt heavenly. It had been well over a month since he'd last been truly clean. It also felt nice to put on clean clothes that weren't grimy and gritty from the weeks of travel, the eight-year-old had not bothered to change his outfit during his journey. Simply washing it when he washed himself in the few rivers he crossed before entering Kei's no Kuni. It also felt rather nice to leave his hair and face uncovered for the first time in a long time and he reveled in being in his familiar orange jumpsuit with a black t-shirt on underneath. The amount of weight he'd lost during his journey was much more evident now that he was in his old jumpsuit. The pants and jacket had always been rather loose and baggy on him but now the pants barely stayed up and his jacket practically hung off of his skinny frame. On the plus side, his traveling diet of wild fruits and vegetables combined with plenty of fresh game, he'd saved the cheap food bars and preserved fruits he'd purchased for the journey for when he couldn't find anything edible, had induced a small growth spurt, due to the influx of vitamins and minerals that weren't found in his usual diet of store-bought ramen, and the eight-year-old now stood two inches taller than he had a month earlier. Naoki-san did a double take when Naruto reappeared after his shower. The eight-year-old looked much different now that he wasn't clothed from head to foot in dark green and black. His bright yellow hair also stood out alongside of the six whisker marks that graced his cheeks. Naruto tensed up a bit when he noticed the man intently studying the facial marks that looked like a cross between a birthmark and a tattoo but relaxed when the man simply smiled and beckoned him to follow him once more. Naruto was soon introduced to Sasaki Izumi, a pretty woman with dark brown eyes and a ready smile, and little three-year-old Sasaki Kanichi. Moments later, he was seated at a small table beside the small family with a large bowl of ramen in front of him alongside a small bowl of steamed rice, and a plate of fish and shrimp tempura. It was a veritable feast for a child that had been dining on scorpions, ground squirrels, cactus fruit, dry meal bars, and dried fruits for most of the past three weeks, the desert and mountains he'd crossed both being far more barren than the forests surrounding Konoha. Despite the meal being much larger than he was used to eating, the eight-year-old managed to eat everything he'd been served and even finagled a second bowl of ramen from Izumi-san by complimenting her cooking skills. Naruto was then shown to a guest room and urged to get some rest when it became apparent he was exhausted. A state that was mostly due to the sheer number of exhausted clones that had begun dispelling not long after he'd sat down to eat. He slept well that night due to a combination of a pleasantly full stomach, a comfortable futon, and the feeling of security that came from sleeping beneath a roof for the first time in weeks. Not even the continued stream of memories pouring in from his dispelling clones disturbed him that night. His host woke him up shortly after dawn the next morning and served him breakfast before he led him through the elemental district to his office. Once they were both seated, Naoki got right down to business as he pulled out a thick stack of blank forms while he launched into an explanation, the elemental districts, of which there are a total of four, one for each portal that was created between our worlds, were created shortly after the elemental countries were sealed away in a dimensional pocket. The purpose of the elemental districts, aside from aiding those who to pass through the portals, regardless of which side they were born on, is to stand watch in order to prevent a war from breaking out between our worlds. As one of the four guardians that stand watch over the portals, I am also tasked to keep a detailed record of all who pass through the West Gate portal. The purpose of those records is threefold. It allows us to keep an accurate record of the number of people that cross over each year. It allows us to keep track of those who pass through the portals and whether or not they return to their point of origin and it allows us to help people search for family members that chose not to return for one reason or another. The individual records are all sealed in such a way that only a guardian may access them. That is to ensure that all who pass through the gates will not be hunted by those that seek to harm them. 
So, before I can make arrangements for a tutor to help you learn how to navigate through this world's cities, I will need you to answer a few questions in order to give me a better understanding of why you chose to travel through the West Gate. Naoki finished as he calmly met Naruto's troubled gaze. We'll start with the easy questions and work our way up to the more difficult questions. First, I'll need to know your birth date, the city or village and country in which you were born, and the names of your parents. Also, if you have any official documents with you, such as a birth certificate, travel papers, or a shinobi identification card, then I will need to see those so that I can make copies of them for your file. Naruto eyed the man for a moment before he pulled out the scroll that contained his family's file that he'd stolen from the storage warehouse well over three months earlier. Once he released the file, he carefully pulled out those documents that he thought would be most relevant. His birth certificate, his parents' birth, marriage and death certificates, and his uncle's birth certificate, medical records, and the document listing the known details of his uncle's quest to seek healing in the outer countries. He carefully withheld anything with any mention of the Kayubi on it. Not wanting the man to turn cold should he learn about the Kayubi sealed inside of the eight-year-old or worse throw him back through the portal because of the demon. Naoki was pleasantly surprised to be presented with those documents as it meant it would be far easier to recreate the appropriate paperwork and documents on this side of the portal. Something that would allow Naruto to travel far easier, which was going to be difficult enough as it was due to his age. That Naruto also had copies of his own medical files and academy records would be helpful too. Though his academic records were far from accurate. After providing Naoki with the basic background information, Naruto tentatively explained that he had left Konoha in order to track down his uncle because the man was potentially his last remaining family he had that was alive. The eight-year-old was then sent to the small clinic within the elemental district in order to undergo a comprehensive medical exam and to be given the standard immunizations that all children his age were required to have. After that, Naruto was taken to sit for an assessment test to see exactly where he sat academically for those subjects that were taught universally on both sides of the portal, such as math, science, reading comprehension, writing composition, and social awareness. The hyperactive blonde was feeling fairly wrung out by the time Naoki collected him and took him back to his house for the evening. He'd never expected to be tested, poked, and prodded all in one day. The next day was only slightly better as he was given a complete mental evaluation and a physical fitness assessment before he was taken to a special facility where his shinobi skills were tested and his chakra levels evaluated. Only the announcement that he was finished with all of the required exams kept him from throwing a temper tantrum about being sent through the ringer for the second day in a row. That night, Naruto would sleep peacefully for the third night in a row in the guest room at the Sasaki residence after spending a couple of hours playing with little Kanichi. Chapter 3. Whirlwind Education Sunday January 31, 1999, Morning, Elemental District, Asahakawa, Hokkaido, Japan. After breakfast on his third day in the Elemental District, Naruto found himself seated once more in Naoki's office while he waited for the man to go over the results of all the tests he'd taken over the past two days. Naruto was more than a little anxious as he had no idea what would happen if he'd failed any of the tests and the last thing he'd wanted was to be sent back to the elemental countries before he'd found out what had become of his uncle. Relax, Uzumaki-kun, you have nothing to worry about, Naoki assured him as he pulled out several thick folders and set them on the desk. Which would you like to discuss first? The results of your tests are the information I was able to retrieve about Namikaze Kichiro. You found Kichiro Oji, Dabeo? Naruto asked excitedly as he jumped out of the chair. Is he still alive? Do you know where he is now? When can I see him? Calm down, Uzumaki-kun, Naoki instructed with a trace of fond exasperation. The man had quickly figured out that Naruto was a fairly hyper and excitable kid. Yes, I found information on Namikaze-san. He arrived in Asahikawa Shi on March 2, 1951 and stayed for almost two years before he left Japan. According to his file, Namikaze-san underwent several surgeries in an attempt to repair his damaged chakra coils and spent roughly 18 months in therapy and training before he changed his name to Evans Gregory and left. My father's note said that Kichiro had been extremely disappointed that his coils could not be fully repaired and chose not to return to the elemental countries because he did not wish to be pitied by his friends and family on the other side. Is he still alive? Do you know where he ended up? I do not know whether or not he is still alive or not. We lost track of him shortly after he left Japan. We do, however, have more than enough information in addition to a couple of pictures of your uncle that we can use to track him down for you. It will just take time since it has been over 40 years since he passed through the elemental district and records from that time period are sometimes difficult to come by. What happens to me though? Ah, that question leads right into our next topic of discussion. The results of your assessment tests. 
physically and medically, you are in perfect health right now even though you are a bit underweight at the moment and there was some evidence of malnutrition for an extended period of time but the damage is already being corrected according the tests that were run. So long as you eat a well-balanced diet from this point forward, you shouldn't have any problems later in life though you will most likely still end up being shorter than average as far as your height goes. Your chakra coils are perfectly healthy and your reserves are abnormally large for someone your age which explains the sheer amount of energy you have. Naruto chuckled weakly and rubbed at the back of his head as the man glanced up to look at him briefly with knowing eyes before he too laughed. Mentally and emotionally, you are mostly well adjusted though there were some concerns by the doctors over some of the results. Tell me, Uzumaki-kun, why did you leave your village in the middle of winter to find an uncle that had potentially died many years ago instead of waiting until you were older and a little better prepared to handle the journey? Why didn't anyone come with you? Surely, there must have been someone who looked after you these past eight years after your parents died. All I ever wanted was to have a family. I didn't care if they were all dead or not. Just knowing I had a family at some point just like everyone else would have been enough. Naruto whispered as he wove his fingers together and clenched his hands tightly. His eyes on the floor and his voice hoarse as he fought to keep his emotions under control. GG the Sandame Hokage, he lied to me for years. Each time I asked him about my parents, he would look me right in the eye and tell me that he didn't know who they were and that I was found abandoned and alone in the wreckage after the Kyubi's attack on the village. He let me believe that my parents didn't want me. He also told me that there was nothing he could do to stop everyone from hating me and calling me names. He said they were just angry about the pranks I played and the trouble I caused each time I acted out but he lied about that too. They hated me long before I started pranking them. He had the Anbu watching me all of the time so that I couldn't leave the village but they never stopped the people that chased and attacked me all the time nor did they stop the drunks from ruining all my things the night they learned where I lived. GG promised to protect me until I could protect myself but he lied again. Naruto glanced up at Naoki with turbulent sapphire eyes as he finished, and if he could lie about those things, then what else was he lying to me about all this time? I couldn't stay after I learned the truth. We will do all we can to help you find your family on this side of the portal, Naoki promised sincerely as he leaned heavily on the desk. Are you going to be alright or would you like to take a break for a bit? I'll be fine, Datbeo, Naruto declared as he automatically slipped on the happy mask he always wore to avoid letting anyone see just how much he was hurting. Okay. If you're certain, we'll finish going over your test results so I can introduce you to a few people. Academically, your test results were rather low but they were nowhere near as low as we feared they would be based upon what the academic records you had brought with you claimed. Part of that, I am certain, is due to how short of an attention span you seem to have and the rest I'm guessing is directly related to the difficulties we've noted in your reading and writing skills. Your physical fitness, on the other hand, is right where it should be for your age group. Earlier, you asked what happened to you while we were trying to hunt down information on your uncle and the answer to that is that we will be tutoring you in order to bring your grades up to the current standards for your age group in addition to teaching you everything you will need to know to survive in this world. We'll also set up your identity and apply for an orphan stipend to make certain you'll have spending money to purchase clothes and anything else you might need or want. You won't have to worry about food, rent, or utility bills though since we'll set you up here in the elemental district to see that your basic needs are taken care of. I have to go to school, but that could take years." Naruto practically whined as he crossed his arms and pouted. Well, you are still a child, Uzumaki-kun, Naoki pointed out with a small grin. You won't actually be attending a regular school though. You'll be tutored by a number of individuals within the district. And you do realize that it might take years to track down your uncle, ne? Does that mean I can use my cage bunshin to help me learn things faster? Cage bunshin? Is that what kind of clones you were using to search the village before we met? How exactly could they help you learn faster? I get all of a cage bunshin's memories when it dies or dispels. So, I learn what it learns. So all of the clones you had out running about the city? They were mapping the city for me so I could find my way around and they were looking for information on my uncle. How many days did it take you to make the hundreds of clones you sent into the city? About 5 or 10 minutes. Nani? I can make 500 clones all at once. I just have to make certain that they all don't die or dispel at the same time because I don't want my brain to explode from too much information. If using that many clones at once is so dangerous, then why were you taught how to make them? I'd like to think that that would be the type of technique that they kept locked up for older shinobi in order to prevent accidents. I taught myself after I copied down the instructions. Do you still have the book or scroll you learned it from? Naoki inquired and Naruto dug into his backpack which he always carried with him everywhere he went because it held all of his things and his money, pulled out the storage scroll that held the jutsu that he'd copied from the Hokage's vault, released the seal that held the scroll filled with the tracings he'd made of several different clone techniques onto, including the Bunshin Bakuha, and passed it over to Naoki. 
The man took a couple of minutes to skim through the flimsy papers for the information on the cage buncheon and the Taju cage buncheon before he let out a whistle, returned the scroll and tracings to Naruto, and stated, I think your clones will be useful so long as you are very careful. I would not wish for you to be hurt. Cool, Datbeo. Naruto retorted with a huge grin before he got a puzzled look on his face as he changed the subject a second later. Say, Naoki GG, you mentioned something about money earlier. Can you tell me how much one Ryo is worth in yen? Before you caught my clone and asked me to meet you, I was thinking about buying some ramen but I didn't know if they'd take Ryo and I'd never heard of yen before. Yen is the form of currency that replaced the Ryo back at the end of the 19th century, Naoki explained once he caught up with Naruto's train of thought. The current exchange rate is roughly 10 yen for every Ryo though you can sometimes get as much as 30 yen for one Ryo, if the coin is in fairly good condition as there are collectors out there that will buy them to add to their collection. If you'd like, I can help you exchange some of your Ryo for yen or you can just save the Ryo you brought with you for if you ever decide to return to the elemental countries. It will only take about a week or two at most for your application to be approved for the orphan stipend though, so you really don't have to exchange any of it if you don't want to. Is it just the coins that I can trade you for or can I trade the paper Ryo too? We can exchange the paper bills for you at a flat rate of 10 yen for every Ryo. We like to keep a ready stash of Ryo available here in the elemental district in order to provide those people, few though they are, that travel from this side of the portal into the elemental countries with the proper currency. Oh, okay, I think I'll just wait for now, that's fine. Did you have any other questions? Anya what type of stuff am I going to have to learn? We'll start by helping you improve your reading and writing skills, teach you world history, geography, and higher levels of math, and start you on English lessons since there is a high probability that your uncle settled down in one of the English-speaking countries based upon the name he chose for himself and the fact that English was one of the subjects he studied while he was here. We'll also teach you about the different world currencies, some of the universal laws which you will need to follow, such as not carrying your weapons in public and not using your shinobi skills in front of anyone outside of the elemental district, and how to use all of the technology that you are unfamiliar with. Will I still have time to train? Yes. We even have a few instructors living in the district that can help you improve your taijutsu if you wish. Our goal is to make certain you have the skills necessary to fit in the world outside of our walls and to make certain that you can protect yourself if you need to. Without resorting to using flashy jutsu or weapons. Do you have any other questions? No? Then let's go introduce you to your tutors. Monday February 1, 1999, Monday May 24, 1999 Elemental District, Asahikawa, Hokkaido. Japan after being introduced to the six adults and one teen that would be teaching him everything he would need to know to in order to survive in the outer countries, Naruto was taken aside by Okamoto Daisuke, the teen, and given a crash course in fashion and slang so that he wouldn't stand out too much and could keep up with other children his age, or older in some cases. Daisuke would also be the one to teach Naruto everything he needed to know about the current technology and how to use those items a kid his age would be expected to use. This would include computers, pagers, handheld video games, CD players, DVD players, and VCRs. He'd spend at least two hours a day with the teen each weeknight and in the afternoons on the weekends. Okamoto Hideyoshi, Daisuke's father, would tutor Naruto in math for an hour on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays and for an hour in basic sciences on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. Teshigahara Aika would then teach him Japanese and world history for an hour a day Monday through Friday while Umeji Masao would help him improve his reading and writing for an hour each morning all five days as well. Umeji Catherine, Masao's wife, would teach him how to speak, read, and write English for two hours each afternoon on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, Catherine being an American who had spent most of her childhood in England before moving to Japan to marry Masao after they'd fallen in love while he was visiting England on holiday. Yamaguchi Rokuro would have Naruto for two hours on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturday for physical education, to teach him about the various sports played in the outer countries as well as to make certain he got plenty of exercise. Rokuro would also lend a hand each morning when Mimori Yoshinori helped Naruto with his taijutsu training and practice. Any free time Naruto had, would be used to either complete his various self-study assignments or used to practice his other shinobi skills so that he didn't grow rusty. It was a rather busy schedule but because most of the lesson periods didn't last for more than an hour, bar his English and physical education lessons, Naruto's attention didn't really have a chance to wander. All six of his adult teachers quickly learned that Naruto was more of a hands-on learner and made it a point to avoid lecturing him since a bored and frustrated Naruto was a troublesome Naruto. Something that was especially true when it came to his clones as they seemed to have an even shorter attention span than the original Naruto did at times. 
And it was important to keep his clones just as busy as the originals because Naruto's clones played a huge part in his education once his teachers had worked out a schedule that would allow him to use the benefits of the cage bunchen without needing to worry about the consequences of overusing them. After breakfast every weekday morning, he created exactly 85 clones that would be assigned various tasks for the day. On the weekends, that number would drop to 20, in order to allow Naruto's brain two days of near rest. Fifteen of the clones would work on chakra control exercises for five hours. Five to work on Ha no Nudo, another five to work on Kinobori no Vaza, and the last five to work on Suimin Hoku no Vaza. That was an equivalent of 75 hours of chakra control training per day. Something that was very important for Naruto due to how large his chakra reserves were. He needed to have excellent control to help him blend in least he draw attention to himself by unleashing a ton of chakra every time he used a technique outside of the elemental district or when he was overly emotional. Thirty clones would follow Naruto each morning to his reading and writing lessons with Masao where they would be split into three groups of ten with one group sitting in on Naruto's lesson for the day, the second group sitting off to one side where they would each read a different book, and the final group practicing their penmanship, five working on kanji and the other five working on romaji. Once the first half of Naruto's hour-long lesson was over, the thirty clones would work for another half an hour on their assigned tasks with the group that had sat in on Naruto's lesson practicing whatever it was he learned that day before all three groups of clones dispelled. Another five clones would practice taijutsu for two hours every morning, the first hour after breakfast while Naruto was attending his reading and writing lessons and the second hour alongside the original Naruto when he met with Yoshinori before they dispelled. During the hour they worked alone, each clone would focus on a specific kata or group of katas while during the second hour, they would work on whatever Yoshinori had Naruto working on in order to reinforce his lessons. Those five clones would then wait an hour before dispelling, so as not to disrupt Naruto's math and science lessons since they would transfer their exhaustion to him the moment they dispelled. The ten clones assigned to work on his math and science, five for each subject, would focus on memorization during the two hours that Naruto was attending his reading and writing lesson and his morning taijutsu practice, the two groups dispelling just before he was due to attend his math or science lessons each day. Hideyoshi would then spend the first 10 minutes of each lesson testing Naruto's memory retention before he either started teaching Naruto new material or had him continue working on the same thing his clones had been studying if he was still struggling with that topic. The next group of 25 clones Naruto created in the mornings would spend 4 hours studying current events. 5 watching the local news, 5 reading about world news, on the internet. A task that also doubled as a computer lesson, 5 reading various local and international newspapers and magazines. 5 watching an assortment of talk shows, and the last 5 listening to the older residents of the elemental district gossip while they taught the clones to play shogi, go, and a number of other strategy games. At the end of those 4 hours and after Naruto had eaten lunch. All 25 of those clones would join Naruto for his daily history lesson. Those 25 clones and the 15 clones working on chakra control would dispel in groups of 5 over the first 10 minutes of the hour following Naruto's history lessons which happened to be an hour of free time for Naruto so he could recover from any exhaustion that was passed to him from his clones. At the end of his short break, Naruto would create 25 new clones that would attend his English lessons with him three days a week. All 25 of those clones would cover exactly what Naruto covered during those lessons in order to reinforce each lesson to make it easier for Naruto to retain everything he learned during each class. Once he had the basics of the new language down, which would be shortly after his first month of lessons, his clones would be split into five groups of five and each group would work on a different assignment that was relevant to the day's lesson while the original Naruto focused on the day's lesson. The number of clones that Naruto would be required to make for his physical education lessons would vary from lesson to lesson as Rokuro only had him make enough clones to form enough players to make two full teams for those team sports that the man was teaching Naruto to play. Having Naruto play with and against teams made up entirely of his own clones allowed him to get a feel for each of the different positions in the various sports. It also taught him how to form a cohesive unit with his clones. An ability that would prove invaluable should he ever return to the elemental countries. On the weekends, the 20 clones that Naruto was allowed to make each morning would be split into two groups. 15 of them to work on 5 hours of chakra control exercises and the other 5 to spend 2 hours alongside of Naruto in taijutsu training. His Saturday physical education lessons would focus on individual activities and physical conditioning exercises in order to negate the need for clones to play additional players. Occasionally, Rokuro would recruit some of the other children living in the elemental district to participate in group activities on Saturdays in order to allow Naruto to socialize and play with other children. 
all of the clones that Naruto had made throughout the day would be finished with their assigned tasks for the day by four in the afternoon when Naruto was released from his English lessons on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays or from his physical education lessons on Tuesdays and Thursdays, the last of his morning clones being dispersed two hours earlier. At that point, Naruto had been asked not to create any additional clones for the rest of the day in order to allow his brain time to rest and to absorb everything he'd learned over the course of the day. This was important because he was adding between 200 and 250 hours of training and lessons per day through the use of the clones or roughly between 1300 and 1500 hours per week. Over the course of his first four months of tutoring and training, Naruto flourished under the positive attention and encouragement he received from everyone living within the elemental district. His grades improved quickly as his tutors took the time to explain things to him instead of yelling at him, calling him a loser, or kicking him out of class and it soon became apparent that Naruto was a very intelligent child with a very active imagination. His physical health and condition also improved due to a combination of a healthy, balanced diet and regular exercise which saw him gaining another two inches in height, meaning he was no longer quite as far below average for his age group. More importantly, Naruto grew mentally, emotionally, and socially during those months as the years of verbal, mental, and emotional abuse he'd suffered were gradually buried. The shadows in his eyes fading as he was allowed to be a child for the first time in his life. A small part of the blonde still remained wary, his subconscious never completely forgetting the abuse he'd suffered for most of his life, and he couldn't quite trust anyone enough to share the truth about the Kyubi with them but that didn't stop him from being truly happy during those months. Outside of his lessons and training, Naruto grew closer to the Sasaki family. Becoming something of an older brother to little Kanichi and a nephew of sorts to Izumi and Naoki. He also continued to live with the small family during those four months of training. Though it had taken him a couple of weeks to get used to living with others the eight-year-old long used to living on his own for the past two years. He soon learned to love living with the family though, the sounds of the others stirring first thing in the morning or of Izumi softly singing Kanichi to sleep each night a constant reminder that he was not alone. At the end of those first four months, Naruto would receive an update on the ongoing search for his uncle. Monday, May 24, 1999, mid-morning Hogwarts Castle, Hogsmeade Village, Scotland 18-year-old Harry Potter, sat up and stretched out his back as he took a brief break from the rather grueling revision schedule that Hermione had put together for the two of them in preparation for taking their NEWTs in just a couple of weeks. The entire school year had been a rather demanding one as he'd needed to learn everything that he'd skipped over or missed out on due to his frequent misadventures during his first six years on top of covering the seventh-year material. It was what he had wanted though, to go back to Hogwarts and earn his NEWTs properly instead of taking the automatic pass that Kingsley Shacklebolt, the newly elected Minister of Magic, had offered to him. Going back to Hogwarts in order to take his seventh year, which he'd originally missed due to the recent war, had also allowed the decorated war hero to avoid a large percentage of his, adoring, fans. It had gotten to the point that the young wizard couldn't even show his face in public without being mobbed by people wanting to touch him, beg him for his autograph, thank him, or curse him, for the part he'd played in ending the war, or tell him exactly why he needed to date or marry them or one of their children. At least at Hogwarts, the blind adoration or open disdain had faded after the first couple of months as all of the students got caught up in their studies, many of them required to repeat a year due to the war. Hermione had, of course, returned to Hogwarts with Harry to take her final year while Ron had opted to accept the automatic passes for his NEWTs in order to get out of an extra year of classes. The redhead had then turned around and joined the Auror Academy, taking the full three-year course of training, and helped his brother George run the joke shop on his off hours. Harry was slated to join the Auror Academy's fast-track program after he finished Hogwarts. Meaning that he'd finish his Auror training the same time as Ron. Shacklebolt had actually offered to bring Harry into the Auror department as a junior Auror right out of Hogwarts but Harry had declined and requested, more like demanded, to go through the training like any other recruit would. Harry was pulled out of his musings by a playful nudge on the shoulder by Ginny Weasley. The green-eyed teen looked up and smiled at his girlfriend. The two of them had gotten back together about a week before Harry's 18th birthday. Their relationship had been rather rocky over the course of the past nine months though. The two of them fought at least twice a month over stupid little things. And while Harry still deeply cared for the red-headed firecracker, he was fully aware that he no longer loved her the way he had once thought he had. He had seen and experienced far too much pain and depravity during the long months that he'd been on the run during what should have been his seventh year and it had changed him. Just as Guinea's harrowing experiences at the school during her sixth year, under the terrible tutelage of Death Eaters that had partially taken over Hogwarts after the Ministry of Magic had fallen to Voldemort, had changed her. As the war had changed them all, 
The young wizard returned to his studies a moment later, completely unaware that the winds of change were stirring and that his carefully planned out future, which had mostly been planned out by others, was about to be rearranged without any warning. Chapter 4. A family found Monday, May 24, 1999, late afternoon elemental district, Asahikawa, Hokkaido, Japan. Come in and have a seat, Naruto-kun, Naoki urged as the blonde knocked on the door to announce his presence. I'll be with you in just a moment. Naruto slipped into the room and quietly sat down while he waited for the man to finish what he was doing, the endless bouncing and swinging of his legs the only evidence of his once boundless energy to be found. Just a few minutes later, Naoki set aside the paperwork he'd been going through and studied the antsy blonde for a moment. I called you to my office today because we've finally managed to pinpoint the last known location of your uncle as the town of Cokeworth in Kent, England, Naoki began after he'd finished his visual inspection. Unfortunately, your uncle and his wife were killed in an automobile accident on August 1, 1977. He's dead? Naruto blurted out in shock as the excitement he'd felt the moment Naoki had said his uncle had been found twisted into grief and utter disappointment. I'm sorry, Naruto-kun. I know how much you were looking forward to finding and meeting your uncle. There is still a chance that you have family out there. Your uncle and his wife had two daughters. Petunia and Lily. Your cousin Lily vanished shortly after her 11th birthday in 1971 and is presumed dead as we've not been able to locate any records for her after her disappearance. However, your cousin Petunia married a man by the name of Vernon Dursley on April 15, 1978 and they have one son named Dursley Dudley who will be 19 this year. If you'd like, I can try to track them down for you. Naruto chewed on his lip for a long time before he replied, could you please? They are still family of course we will, I'll let you know the moment we find them. Thanks, Naoki GG. You're welcome, Naruto-kun. Now get out of here and go burn off some energy." Naruto laughed and bolted out of the room so he could find a quiet place to think about what he had just learned that afternoon. On one hand, he was happy to know that he still had family out there but on the other hand, he was sad to know that his uncle had died. The man had been the driving force behind his leaving Konoha and he would have been someone that would have understood Naruto due to their shared origins. He was also a bit disappointed to learn that he didn't have any cousins his age. The eight-year-old didn't stay depressed for long as he threw himself into his lessons with renewed determination in the hopes that it wouldn't take anywhere near as long to track down his cousins as it had to find his uncle. His English lessons were given priority now that it was confirmed that he would need to know the language in order to easily communicate with his cousins, since there was no guarantee that Petunia been taught Japanese by his uncle before he died. His history lessons also shifted to focus on England's current affairs and the island nation's history for the last 100 years. Six and a half weeks later, Naoki interrupted Naruto's lunch to tell him that they'd tracked down his cousin's family. The man tried to talk the eight-year-old into writing a letter to the woman to introduce himself but Naruto stubbornly insisted on both introducing himself in person and traveling alone. Naoki eventually caved and helped Naruto prepare for his trip to England, the older man fully aware of just how independent Naruto still was despite his age. He'd at least managed to talk the eight-year-old out of traveling on foot. To start with, Two identities were created for Naruto. One for his eight-year-old self, which included changing his last name to Evans, and one for his chaperone which would be played by one of his clones. He then converted all of the money he'd been saving since he arrived from yen to pounds sterling, bar what he'd need to pay for his trip, traded all of his paper Rio for pounds, and had Naoki auction off two complete sets of Rio coins, each set containing one coin of each denomination in mint or near mint condition, to the highest bidders. Netting the blonde close to two and a half million yen that was then also converted into British pounds, with a small commission being paid to the elemental district. Daisuke then took Naruto to purchase a small luggage set, to keep up appearances, a couple sets of nicer clothes, and a bunch of reading books, in both Japanese and English, music CDs, travel games, word searches, crossword puzzles, and Sudoku puzzles, and coloring books and colored pencils. He was still a kid after all, to keep him from getting bored during his flight. He also stocked up on cheap, but healthy, snacks and drinks in case he got hungry during the 12-hour flight. The things that he'd brought with him when he left Konoha were carefully reorganized into a single, larger custom scroll that was 18 inches tall, nearly 8 inches in diameter, and roughly 20 feet in length when unrolled. All of his tracings had then been copied over properly onto smaller scrolls to preserve them before they were individually sealed into storage seals within the larger scroll. The nature of the scroll was then disguised with a thin layer of rice paper that had been painted with watercolors. Turning the storage scroll into a family heirloom which would allow Naruto to carry it tied to the bottom of his backpack through security and customs with little to no hassle. Friday July 30, 1999, afternoon Asahikawa Airport, Asahikawa, Hokkaido, 
Japan Naruto climbed out of the taxi with his backpack in hand on the heels of one of his cage bunch and wearing a henge that looked suspiciously like Kenzaki Tuchi, the ramen chef from Konoha. He trembled with barely suppressed excitement as he glanced up to watch an airplane flying overhead. While he'd enjoyed the past several months he'd stayed with the Sasaki family, he was really looking forward to meeting his family. Come on, Naruto-kun. Let's get the two of you checked in, Naoki instructed as he finished paying the taxi driver and stepped beside Naruto and his disguised clone. Checking in was a fairly simple matter as there wasn't much a line. All they had to do was confirm their reservations for the next flight to Tokyo International Airport, also known as Haneda Airport, send the two suitcases, filled with a few changes of clothes, extra toiletries, and a few other odds and ends, through the baggage check, and collect their tickets. Naoki then escorted the pair through the airport to their assigned loading terminal and made certain that they had no trouble getting through security before he reluctantly bid the eight-year-old goodbye. Take care, Naruto-kun. Call me the moment you arrive in London and get settled in. I will, Naoki GG, Naruto thickly replied. Thank you for everything. You're welcome, Gaki, Naoki replied as he ruffled Naruto's hair before he crouched down and addressed the eight-year-old in a serious tone. If things don't work out with your cousin, I want you to know that you're welcome to come back and stay with us. No matter what, you will always have a place in the elemental district and I hope you'll keep in touch with us. Even if you do find a home in England with your relatives. I won't ever forget you or my friends here in Asahikawa, Datbeo, Naruto swore as he gave Naoki a large grin and two thumbs up. Twenty minutes later, Naruto was gripping the armrests of his window seat as the plane rushed down the runway and lifted off the ground. The eight-year-old whipped his head sideways and stared out the window with wide eyes as the ground fell away. He then let out a gasp of awe as they reached cruising altitude and he saw the entirety of Japan, a good portion of continental Asia, and a large expanse of ocean below him. He almost envied the birds their freedom to see the world from the heavens any time they wanted to but at the same time it was more than a little daunting to see just how large the world truly was with his own eyes. Is this your son's first time flying? The middle-aged woman seated in the aisle seat of their row asked of Naruto's adult clone. He's not my son. I was appointed by the courts to escort him to his only remaining family. The clone corrected politely using the excuse they'd come up with for his presence as he looked up from the book he was reading. But yes, this is his first time on an airplane. Goman, I did not mean to assume ma, ma. Don't worry about it, no harm done. Naruto and his clone were left to themselves at that point. The woman still a bit embarrassed about her very minor social blunder. Naruto didn't mind as he enjoyed watching the clouds moving in the distance or staring down at the world below them. Sadly, the small hop from Asahikawa to Tokyo was nowhere near long enough and before Naruto was ready, the plane was circling around the airport as it dropped lower. He nearly started hyperventilating when he saw just how large the capital city of Japan was in comparison to Asahikawa and the other nearby towns and cities that he'd visited over the past few months. Sure. He'd seen pictures of large cities but pictures didn't quite capture the sheer size of the sprawling metropolis spread out beneath the plain. He avoided a panic attack by reminding himself that he didn't have to actually set foot in the city as he only had a three-hour layover in Tokyo before he boarded the plane that would take him to Great Britain. All thoughts about the size of Tokyo flew out of the eight-year-old's mind when he was introduced to the crowded halls of Haneda Airport. He was far too busy trying to figure out where he needed to go next and almost wishing he'd not been quite so determined to travel alone. Thankfully, the airport staff were happy to give him directions, or rather they gave his clone directions, and the two of them went through the check-in process a second time, their luggage being transported over separately. The eight-year-old took a small side trip to the bathroom to replace his clone, since it had taken a few hits as they walked through the airport and Naruto feared the next accidental shove might dispel the clone or the henge it wore, before he all but plastered himself to the window in the waiting area so he could watch the planes take off and land. He couldn't wait to for his next flight to take off. The blonde eager to see what the world looked like from the sky during the night, the sun had set shortly after their first flight had landed. Naruto's temporary guardian, his clone, drew him away from the window 45 minutes before they were due to board their flight and reminded him to eat the bento that Izumi had given to him before he left. When he opened up the beautifully carved wooden bento box she'd packed the meal in, a gift from the kind woman. Naruto felt a lump form in his throat as he found three onigiri decorated to look like Kanichi, Daisuke, and Naruto in addition to the chilled shrimp, a small garden salad, and a couple of Naruto's favorite cookies. Taped to the top of the lid in a protective plastic cover, was Izumi's family recipe for salt ramen. Wiping the moisture from his eyes, Naruto dug into the delicious meal with gusto after carefully transferring the sacred recipe for the food of the gods into his backpack where he knew it wouldn't get lost. He'd place it with the dozens of other ramen recipes he'd diligently gathered later, 
There was no denying that the blonde was utterly obsessed with ramen and completely devoted to devouring as many different types of ramen as possible. Being able to make such heavenly food whenever he wanted, thanks to the recipes and cooking lessons from Izumi, was just an added bonus. Naruto finished his meal and wiped out the bento box with a couple of napkins, to keep it from growing mold or starting to smell of rotten food since it would be a while before he could wash the box out, just five minutes before one of the flight attendants announced that his flight would begin boarding those individuals seated in first class and those traveling with children. Naruto and his clone were two of the first people to line up. The eight-year-old vibrating with excitement as their tickets were checked and they were allowed to enter the jetway leading to the plane. The moment he found their seats, Naruto tucked his backpack beneath the seat in front of him, put on his seatbelt, so he wouldn't forget later, and plastered his face back to the window as he stared out at the glaring lights of the city in the distance. Naruto was twitching with impatience ten minutes later as the other passengers were still looking for their seats, stowing their belongings, and sitting down. He wouldn't settle down until the airplane began taxiing out to the runway while the flight attendants gave the same safety demonstration they'd given on his first flight. Naruto barely listened to them as he kept craning his neck back and forth so he could see as much of the darkened landscape and bright lights as possible. And then they were speeding down the runway and lifting off the ground once more and Naruto would spend most of the flight with his face once more glued to the window. He barely pulled his attention away from the view, even when there was nothing to see but dark clouds and the stars, to eat the in-flight meal. Naruto eating both his meal and the clone since there was really no point in the clone eating. His clone, on the other hand, spent the flight working on the Sudoku puzzles, watching the in-flight movie, and pretending to keep an eye on the original Naruto. If anyone who had known Naruto prior to his leaving Konoha had seen him sitting quietly and practically unmoving as he stared out the window, they would have immediately assumed that he was an imposter because Naruto never sat still. At least he hadn't prior to spending time in the elemental district where his boundless energy had been given an abundance of outlets so that he wasn't quite so hyper all of the time. Oh. He still tended to be constantly in motion 90% of the time, especially when he was excited, but he could now actually sit still for hours at a time without feeling completely restless simply because his days had been filled with tons of activities. His attention span had also increased due to the increase in physical and mental activities and his growing control over his abundance of chakra. It was now quite easy for him to focus for an hour at a time before he grew bored with the time exponentially increasing for those topics or activities that he found interesting, such as enjoying the view outside of the plane's window or completing Sudoku puzzles he absolutely loved number games and recognizing the patterns in groups of numbers came easy to him. Naruto almost let out a whine when the captain announced that they were approaching Heathrow International Airport in London, England, another overwhelmingly large city. The only thing that stopped him from voicing a complaint was the fact that he'd been sitting still for far too long and now that he was no longer so focused on the view, he was beginning to feel the need to move set in, he had been sitting still for an abnormally long period of time. He was once again twitching with impatience by the time the plane touched down and began heading towards the terminal gate. The hour and a half it took to get through customs once they were allowed off the plane didn't help and a number of the other passengers glared at him in annoyance while a few of the more understanding passengers actually allowed Naruto's clone and Naruto to cut in front of them. The familiar cold glares he'd received from a number of people that had little patience for children actually helped him calm down as it brought back painful memories of living in Konoha. They were met just outside of the customs area by the taxi driver that Naoki had arranged to meet him at the airport, to save Naruto the need to try and flag down a taxi in the rush of people coming and going. The man helped them navigate through the maze that was Heathrow so they could pick up Naruto's luggage before they headed outside to where the cab driver had parked his car. The ride to the hotel where Naruto would be staying for a couple of days, to allow him to adjust to the time differences and to get a feel for the new culture he was entering, was made in complete silence as the eight-year-old stared out the car window at the sheer number of buildings, people, and cars that appeared everywhere he looked despite the time of night, which was after midnight London time. By the time they had arrived at the hotel, paid the cab fare, checked into the hotel, and unlocked their room, Naruto was exhausted despite the fact that he hadn't really done anything but sit around for the last 18 or 20 hours. The eight-year-old hung up the do not disturb on the door, to let the hotel staff know not to wake him up in the morning, locked the door, dismissed his clone, changed into his pajamas, and crawled into bed. He was asleep before his head hit the pillow and would not wake up until well after noon the next day. After taking a shower and washing out his bento box, Naruto created eight new clones and set seven of them to working on chakra control exercises, one in the tub to work on Suomen Hoko no Waza. 5 to climb the walls for Kinobori no Waza, and 1 to practice Hano Nudo using a bunch of leaves he'd stored in storage scrolls before he'd left the elemental district. The final clone used the henge to take the form of his temporary guardian so he could call the front desk to ask the staff on duty to call for a taxi. 
Before he left with his foe guardian, Naruto reminded the clones that he was leaving behind to hide if the maid came in while he were gone. The eight-year-old then headed down to the lobby to wait for his ride, taking the time to ask a couple of the workers where there was a good place to get some Japanese food, specifically ramen. Armed with the names of three restaurants to try, Naruto bravely stepped outside of the hotel to face Greater London as his taxi arrived. His first stop was the first of the recommended restaurants for lunch. Naruto had his priorities after all. After three bowls of what he considered inferior ramen, Naruto and his clone paid for their food and slipped outside to find an out-of-the-way place where he could call up a few dozen cage bunchen without anyone seeing him. Half an hour later, the bird population of London jumped by 200 in the blink of an eye as dozens of crows, sparrows, starlings, and pigeons took the air. Naruto and his guardian then spent the rest of the afternoon doing touristy things. Like visiting Hyde Park so Naruto could burn off some energy. After the sunset, the pair went to the second Japanese restaurant that had been recommended to him and he had six bowls of some tasty beef ramen, though it still fell short of Izumi's heavenly salt ramen. Once Naruto finished his ramen, the two of them took a nighttime tour via taxi of some of the more notable landmarks in the area, Big Ben and the London Eye two such places, before they returned to their hotel for the evening. He'd fall asleep shortly after returning when the fatigue his clones had built up doing the chakra control exercises for most of the hit him. The next day, Naruto would stay in the hotel room all day working on his taijutsu katas, chakra control exercises, and sorting through his memories from the clones that had been out exploring the city all night long as they dispersed in groups of five every 10 to 15 minutes. If he hadn't been so nervous about meeting his cousins the next day, he might have spent the day sightseeing again but he couldn't really bring himself to face the city while his stomach was all tied up in knots. Before he went to sleep that night, he made certain to seal all of his belongings bar his backpack into a scroll including his suitcases, so he wouldn't leave anything behind by mistake. Monday, August 2, 1999, late morning No. 4 Privet Drive, Little Whinging, Surrey, England Naruto nervously hovered behind the cage bunchen wearing the face of his chosen, guardian, while he waited for someone to answer the door. He'd arrived at the address that Naoki had provided him just a few minutes earlier and his stomach felt like he'd swallowed a ton of rocks. All heavy and knotted. Before he could work himself into a complete panic, the door was opened by a thin woman with a rather long neck, dark blonde hair liberally streaked with grey, and blue eyes that were washed out in comparison to Naruto's vibrant sapphire orbs. Good morning, Naruto's clone greeted neutrally as the woman gave the pair of them a rather plastic smile while her eyes flashed with annoyance, making the real Naruto tense up. Whatever it is you are selling, we are not interested, the woman snapped as her fake smile immediately became a scowl for some reason. My apologies, I am not selling anything. I am looking for a Dursley Petunia, formerly Evans Petunia, and was given this address. What do you want? My charge wished to meet with you and your family since according to our records, you are his only surviving family. What? Petunia all but screeched as her eyes bugged out. No no, that's impossible. I have no other family. I have valid documentation proving that this young man is your father's nephew Shush Petunia hissed vehemently as she leaned out and glanced up and down the street before roughly pulling both the clone and Naruto into the house and slamming the door shut. Have you no decency? Showing up here without so much as a by your leave or a warning only to start spouting lies while standing in full view of the entire neighborhood. My father was an only child. I have birth certificates I don't care. I already dealt with one ungrateful brat that was dumped on my porch. I'm not about to deal with another, like I'd want to live with an ugly old hag like you anyway." Naruto snapped as he glared at the woman that was supposedly one of his only living family members. His heart hurting with the knowledge that his cousin could be so cruel. I only wanted to meet you because you were family. How dare you call me names you you wretched brat. You started it, you stupid hag, Naruto's clone disguised clone maturely pointed out. Petunia spluttered indignantly for several seconds before she lashed out and slapped Naruto's clone across the face. The blow hard enough to dispel the cage bunchen in a cloud of smoke. The woman let out a strangled scream as her eyes went even wider and her hands flew up to cover her mouth in utter horror. The expression on her face then turned positively ugly as she fixed her eyes on the startled Naruto. The eight-year-old had not expected the woman to actually hit his clone, let alone hit it hard enough to dispel it. Freak! Demon! Monster! Petunia exclaimed in a hissing screech. How dare you pollute my home with your unnaturalness! The woman then began wringing her hands as a fearful look passed over her face. They'll know just like they knew when they dropped that other ungrateful wretch on our porch. I'll not have it. Not again, but they will be watching. They are always watching. What will I do? I won't keep another filthy freak in the house. I won't. The woman paced back and forth, practically frothing at the mouth as she rubbed at her face and neck with frantic hands every so often. 
Naruto remained frozen in the middle of the hallway. The woman currently standing between him and the only exit he was aware of. Fear coiled in the blonde's belly as the woman finally recalled his presence and she reached out, grabbed him by the scruff of the neck unexpectedly, and half dragged, half pushed him down the hall. Vernon will know what to do, he'll fix everything this time. I'll call him right now, Petunia babbled as she stopped beside a small door in the middle of the hallway, opened the door, and shoved Naruto inside what turned out to be a rather small closet before she slammed the door shut and locked the door behind him. You stay right there you wretched little monster, my husband will deal with you when he gets home. Naruto fell back against the wall and slid down onto the floor before he curled up on himself and tried not to cry as reality crashed down around him. He was trapped in a closet in the house of a crazy woman and no one knew he was there, aside from a handful of people back in Japan. Maybe he should have listened to Naoki and written a letter first. Naruto had no idea how long he'd been locked in the small closet before he heard a door slam open and an angry voice bellow out as the house fairly shook under heavy footsteps, where'd you stash the new freak, pet? I locked him in the cupboard, I didn't know what else to do with him, Petunia whined frantically, her tone borderline hysterical. Did any of the neighbors see him? I don't know. I don't think anyone saw him or the other freak that dropped him off but I can't be sure. They caught me off guard this morning when they showed up out of the blue. What are we going to do, Vernon? We'll get rid of him. We might not have been able to dump the last brat on the streets to live in the gutter where he belonged but there's nothing to stop us from ditching the newest freak. That ruddy dumbfedork bloke is dead. We'll keep the boy in the cupboard until the weekend and then I'll take him up north and throw him in the river or something. Are you sure it will be safe to wait that long? Yes, I don't want him to end up somewhere too close because he's liable to find his way back here again and bring more of the freaks with him. I'll run to the store and pick up a few more locks too for the door to keep him from using his freakishness to get out like the boy did. I'll shove the couch in front of the door for now just in case he tries any funny business while I'm gone. I'll pick up some takeaway for supper on the way back so you won't have to worry about cooking. Thank you, dear, I don't know what I would do without you, Vernon. The man, Vernon, grunted in response before a loud scraping sound was heard as a fairly large piece of furniture was positioned in front of the door to the closet. Naruto sank even deeper into despair as he wrapped his arms around his legs and pressed his face into his knees. His relatives not only hated his guts but they were talking about killing him. Knowing that it was his relatives, his own flesh and blood, that were speaking of him in that way, when they really didn't know him, hurt far worse than anything the villagers of Konoha had said or done to him. He eventually drifted off to sleep as a steady stream of tears trickled down his face. He snapped awake sometime later when he heard something heavy being shoved aside followed by several unfamiliar curse words and unrecognizable sounds. A moment later, a grinding whir sounded as someone did something to the door to Naruto's makeshift prison. It took a moment for the eight-year-old to realize that Vernon must have returned from the store and that the man was probably installing the locks he'd spoken of buying. Angry over the way he was being treated, Naruto launched himself at the door and began pounding on it as he demanded, Let me out of here, Teme. Shut up, freak, or I'll bury you out in the backyard until I can get rid of your body. Naruto recoiled in horror over the threat and immediately stuffed himself in the smallest corner of the closet in the hopes that he'd be overlooked if the man actually attempted to carry out his threat. Once the man was finished doing whatever it was he was doing to the door, he stomped off. He tensely sat huddled up beneath the slanted and uneven roof of the closet for several hours listening to the muted sounds that floated to his prison from somewhere else in the house before pounding footsteps shook the ceiling as they traveled upwards. Silence settled over the entire house not long after that and Naruto sniffled a bit as he tightened his arms around his knees and tried not to think about the fact that his relatives somehow already knew about the Kyubi, they'd called him a demon, after all, and that they intended to kill him. He eventually drifted off to sleep once more where he was plagued by old and new nightmares until the faint sound of metal scraping against metal dragged him back into consciousness. Two minutes later, the door to the closet silently swung open as a small triangle of light pierced the gloom within. Hey, kid. Are you alright? A voice asked in a low volume that wouldn't carry very far and Naruto couldn't help the small whimper that escaped as he pressed himself further backwards when a blonde head appeared and began searching the closet for him. Hey, don't be afraid. I promise I'm not going to hurt you. I'm really sorry about the way my parents are treating you. They've been like that for as long as I can remember and they only got worse after the war. The person soon caught sight of Naruto huddled in the back of the closest and the look on his face grew sad when Naruto didn't say anything. The boy or possibly young man then sighed and glanced upwards before he sat down in the doorway and leaned back against the door jamb. I suppose I can't blame you for not trusting me, I wouldn't trust me either if I'd had to put up with all of the things that mum and dad said and did. I'd really, really like to help you though. I already sent off a letter to Harry in the hopes that he'll be able to come get you before dad carries out his threats. 
Who's Harry and are you Dursley Dudley? Naruto tentatively asked as the unfamiliar name immediately caught his attention. Harry's my cousin well. I suppose he'd be your cousin too if you really are mum's cousin like that man said you were this morning. He's Aunt Lily's son. And yes, I'm Dudley Dursley. Is there a reason why you keep saying our names backwards? Goman er, sorry, I keep forgetting that first and last names are mixed up in English. I'm still learning to speak your language. Don't sweat the small stuff kid. It's not that big of a deal. What language do you usually speak if it's not English? Japanese. I was born just outside of Japan. Did you say the hairy guy you mentioned earlier was Lily's son? Wasn't Lily Petunia's younger sister? I thought she died when she was 11. How could she have a kid if she died when she was just a kid? Aunt Lily had Harry before she died when I was still a baby. Harry was just a few months younger than I was at the time and he came here to live with mum and dad. That's kind of cool that you're from Japan. One of these days I'd love to travel around the world and visit different countries. Naruto shrugged in response and relaxed a bit as he slowly grew comfortable in the older boy's presence. So, what's your name? Dudley asked after the two of them stared at each other in the dim light for several minutes. Uzu-er, Evans Naruto. Naruto would be your first name, right? Hi-er, yes. Naruto is my first name, Naruto corrected even as he nodded. It's really nice to meet you, Naruto. Could you tell me what it was you said before said your name? Uzu, I think it was. I almost used my mother's last name because that's what I thought my last name was for a long time until I learned about my father and his uncle. Her name was Uzumaki Kashina. Where are your parents? They died when I was just a baby. You really do have quite a bit in common with Harry, Dudley stated in surprise as he shifted just enough for the light to illuminate his pale blue eyes. My mum and dad stuffed him in this cupboard when he was little too and he can do all kinds of cool tricks and stuff but my parents can't stand the things he does. Anyway, what do you say we get you out of here so you can go to the bathroom and clean up while I fix you a little something to eat? You can stay in my room with me until we hear from Harry. Won't you get in trouble for letting me out? Naruto asked skeptically as he eyed his cousin. Only if they find out but they won't even check to make certain you're still there if I lock the cupboard back up once you're out. You'll just need to be really quiet or else mum and dad will hear you and there's no telling how they'll react to finding you out of the cupboard. Naruto studied the older boy for a full minute before he crawled towards him. He really didn't want to stay in the closet any longer. That's it for part 1. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.